Okay. So finish up. If you just walked in, do the Socrative quiz. It's just one question. Shouldn't take you very long. What we're talking about today is we finally get into gene expression regulation. I've used this term gene expression a few times. What does it mean? We talk about gene expression, gene activity. So yeah, is the gene going to get transcribed and translated? So does the gene actually produce the protein that it encodes, or does it not? So it's being expressed, it's being transcribed, gene is being transcribed into RNA and translated to get protein. This is one example of gene expression that we already looked at once in class. We were talking about Crohn's disease and the genetic basis of inflammatory bowel disease, essentially, Crohn's disease. And these authors had a hypothesis that somewhere in a particular region of one of the chromosomes, one of these genes close to each other in the chromosome controls the trait of Crohn's disease. So just as a brief reminder, these scientists took each of these genes, they just wanted to know, is it being expressed more in people that have Crohn's disease versus people that don't? So we compared the Crohn's versus control gene expression, with gene expression on the y-axis being lots of gene expression going up, no gene expression being zero. So all of these genes are being transcribed and translated at some rate. So none of these are at zero. Right? They're all above zero. But there was one situation where there was a significant difference. in expression, in IRF1. So this is one reason that scientists care about learning about whether or not genes get transcribed or not. If a gene's not being transcribed, it doesn't produce its protein. Sometimes we can correlate that with diseases. And that's the concept of gene expression. So what we want to know is how does gene expression get regulated? How does a cell know when it's supposed to transcribe a gene and when not? So this is just one example, in case you're not familiar with the concept of gene expression regulation yet, of what it looks like. So imagine that you're a cyanobacterium. You're photosynthetic. What sort of genes, what sort of proteins do you want to have to help you photosynthesize and make energy for you? Think broadly. I don't need specific. What do you need to do in order to photosynthesize? What's the first step? You need sun. So what sort of a protein do you need to make use of the presence of the sun? You need some sort of, so chloroplast organelle, you need some sort of protein that does what with sunlight? I'm a plant or a cyanobacterium. I'm sitting there. What's the first thing I need to do with the sunlight? I have to capture it. Right? I need a protein that will absorb light, absorb energy, and then translate that into chemical energy somehow through a series of proteins that convert chemical energy, convert light energy into chemical energy. If I want to be really successful as a cyanobacterium, blue green algae, if I want to photosynthesize and I want to be as efficient as possible to make the best use out of all the sunlight I get. When would I want to turn those proteins on? When would, I, when would I want to be making the proteins I use to capture light? This is the easy answer. It's not a trick question. When it's light outside. So these bacteria would prefer to turn on the proteins needed for capturing light during the daytime. And they wouldn't want them at night. What's the point? You're using all this energy, building proteins. It's 2 a.m., there's no sunlight. You're waiting there to capture the sunlight, and basically you're just using up spare amino acids. You make the excess protein when you don't need it. So we know that a lot of bacteria, in this case, and also plants, have 
cycles of when they produce certain types of proteins. So in plants have, in, in case you've taken these classes before, right, in dark reactions, in light reactions, in photosynthesis, some things happen at night when there's no sun, and different things happen during the day when sunlight is available. So what this movie shows is what happens at night, the moon, and during the day, the sun, in this particular strain of cyanobacteria. And what these authors have done is they've taken a single fluorescent protein and they've put it under the control of a promoter, part of the gene that controls whether or not transcription occurs or not. On the left side, this protein is being controlled by a promoter that turns on genes at night. And on the right side, you're going to see what happens when the same fluorescent protein, the gene that encodes the fluorescent protein, is instead controlled by a different promoter. One in cyanobacteria that turns on genes that cyanobacteria want to have turned on at night. So this is gene expression regulation. So these authors turn off, so you can see the two lines of these green bacteria. They turn off the lights, and now we're looking at fluorescence. So we've got daytime, nighttime, and this is not this is not a loop. This is just them photographing compressing like 72 hours into about 20 seconds. So you see the nighttime promoter turn on transcription and translation of this protein, then that turns off. Then during the daytime, a different promoter turns on the daytime gene. And this bacterium has these regulatory elements inside it that in a circadian rhythm turn off some genes during the day and turn on others, and then at night, it flips. So even bacteria do this. So the goal for today, of many, is to be able to predict how different mutations will affect transcription, control of transcription, and then by next class to be able to actually design a mutation, <coughs> theoretically, that would have a specific effect on transcription that you might want to have. Turn it off, turn it on. Just like bacteria do. Here are all of the properties of living things. You probably got this in one of the other classes, so I want to go over in great detail. Of these seven different requirements of something to be classified as a living organism, you have to have senses to do at least three of them. So I hope you agree with me, senses are kind of critical. Kind of. It would be sad not to have any of our senses, right? not be able to smell, taste, touch, etc. So to be able to adapt, to be able to regulate, to be able to reproduce, to be able to, especially number five, to be able to respond to the environment, we have to be able to sense. Do bacteria have senses? Do bacteria, yes. Do bacteria feel? Do they smell? Do they taste? What senses do bacteria have? They're alive. Viruses, maybe we could have a debated, a contested debate about whether or not viruses are alive. Bacteria are living things. What senses do they have? How can they possibly respond to their environment? You just saw an example of bacteria responding to their environment. They turn genes on when it's nighttime, turn other genes on when it's daytime. How do they know when it's like nighttime or daytime? They must have senses, yes. They can sense something about their environment. They do not have eyes, so they can't tell when it's light outside. Well, fortunately, we're not here to debate or discuss how bacteria know it's light outside. But I'm going to use today as an example from your textbook, or at least from one of the textbooks that we're using, Something you've probably heard about in many classes already, the lac operon, genes that allow bacteria to digest the sugar lactose, and how bacteria control when those genes are turned on and turned off. It's exactly like the light scenario, capturing light for energy. 
bacteria have lots of different types of sugars that they might encounter in their environments. Here are a few listed at the top. So exactly the same scenario. If you're a bacteria, you want to know what sugar is available to you. You want to know, are, am I in glucose, am I in sucrose, am I in galactose, am I in lactose? Because each of those sugars require a different you, set of proteins necessary to metabolize, to chew up that particular type of sugar. So make a prediction. Do bacteria always have all of the proteins necessary to metabolize all the different types of sugars at once? What do you think? Bacteria are always 24-7 making the proteins they need to metabolize sucrose, fructose, galactose, glucose, hexose, mannose. What do you think? No. Why not? Because it takes a lot of energy. So if the bacteria don't have all of those sugars available to them, what would be the point of making all those proteins? So the whole point here is to be efficient. That's the evolutionary goal, in other words. So how prokaryotes regulate gene expression? You saw this in a video while I was on the East Coast at a conference. But again, remember that one of the first steps is the binding of a sigma factor to a specific sequence of DNA at the promoter. And that's the initiation of a cascade that turns on transcription. And what that sigma factor does is bring in a complex of proteins that we call RNA polymerase. So sigma 70 binding is the first step. That's a protein. How does it know where to bind to DNA? How does sigma know where to bind DNA sequence and turn on transcription of a gene? There's a gene down here. How does sigma factor know where, which part of DNA to bind to? How does it know where the genes are? They just bind anywhere? goes around the bacterial chromosome, binding, 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 until it finds a gene and turns it on. Yeah, there's a specific sequence of DNA in the promoter that sigma factors bind to. So the important points here are two. One is that sigma factor has a DNA binding domain. So part of that protein is responsible for recognizing a specific sequence of nucleotides and binding to it. What other job does sigma factor do? What else can it do? It binds DNA. What else physically does it do? Shown up here. Contacts two different types of molecules. It binds DNA and it binds beta prime. Some sort of blob, a pink circle or oval. Yeah, it binds RNA polymerase. So over here, Sigma factor has a protein interaction domain. In this case, it's specific to RNA polymerase. So sigma 70 does two things. It's got a part of its protein surface that recognizes and binds to DNA. The other part of it is important in protein-protein interactions. When, when it binds to DNA, then it grabs onto polymerase and brings it in. There are ways that proteins help that process, and there are ways that proteins hinder that process. This is transcriptional regulation. Does RNA polymerase get a chance to transcribe a gene or not? So how could that work? On the left side, we've got positive regulation. That means that there are proteins that are involved in enhancing or turning on transcription, positive. And then you've got negative regulation. So we've got Repressors that bind operators, this is an unfortunate but critical part of the terminology here. A repressor is a protein. The operator is a DNA sequence it binds to. And on the positive side, we've got proteins called activators. 
and they bind to the promoter. In this case, this particular graphic calls it an activator binding site. But generically, we can just call that the promoter. So we've got two different types of proteins, activators and repressors. They activate and repress transcription, but they bind to two different types of DNA. Can you imagine why the operator is located between the promoter and the gene itself? So on the right, we've got a drawing here where there's a repressor protein bound to a DNA sequence. The promoter's on one side, the gene's over here. Why? How's a repressor going to repress transcription? What physically does the repressor protein do that stops transcription from happening? It blocks something. It's a physical barricade. So why is it between the promoter? What happens at the promoter? Where does sigma bind? Okay, so where is polymerase? What does polymerase do to transcribe from this point? Sigma factor leaves once it brings RNA polymerase in. RNA polymerase is sitting there on the gene, on the DNA. What does the repressor do? It blocks it. Yeah. So the repressor protein bound to DNA is just a roadblock. It sits on the DNA, and RNA polymerase, no matter how hard it tries, can't move past the repressor protein. So that's one physical mechanism for controlling the transcription of a gene. You have repressor proteins that block polymerase from actually accessing and transcribing the gene. Any questions at this point? I already made these summaries on the previous slide. It's just for your use in case it's useful. So let's say we have two genes. We're going to practice drawing genetic pathways today. This has everything to do with the Socrative quiz that you took at the start of class. Let me check on the outcome of that. You know, about three quarters of you got the right answer. So. We can go over this relatively quickly. Say you've got genes A and gene B. <coughs> We've got two different types of pathways we can draw, either the pointed arrow or the blunt arrow between gene A and gene B. So what does it mean if protein A arrow protein B? What does that tell us, this first scenario? If protein A activates, there are a number of words we could use here, sustains, promotes. So the presence of protein A causes an increase or a sustainment or an enhancement or something like that of protein B. What are the positive sounding words? Gene, if protein A is present, then protein B is present, active. What does it mean when there's a blunt arrow? What, is, what sorts of things might gene A be doing to gene B, or protein A to protein B? Pardon? Is it so this is a repressor, yeah, a repression. So we've got activation on the top, we've got repression on the bottom. What sort of physical form could repression take? Protein A does something to protein B. What could protein A be doing to protein B inside the cell? How does a protein repress another protein? Yeah. So it could, yeah, absolutely. So gene A could be binding to an active site, covering up. an active site that's present on protein B. What else could protein A do to protein B? So it could be allosteric 
Debatable. Debatable. Allosteric usually occur, involves small molecules, not proteins, but we'll, we'll go with it. So if protein A is bound to protein B, let's say protein A looks like this and protein B looks like this. It might be that when protein A is bound to protein B, this would be the top one, binding an active site. If this here in protein B is the active site, you've got a protein that now is preventing any other small molecules from entering the active site. So you've basically got protein A not allowing protein B to do its job. What is allosteric? So that's an example of how binding an active site might repress. What's allosteric? Okay. So it's the same but different. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like, I don't know, like a ligand binds to a receptor but not on the actual active site. Right. Away from the active site, but it's still part of like a structural change. I guess we'll get to. Yeah, so there's a, okay, so the important thing is that allosteric involves a structural change. It's an interaction, allosteric interactions is an interaction between a small molecule and a protein that changes the shape of that protein. So you might imagine that you've got a protein, let's model it in red, that binds to DNA like this. So it wraps itself around the double helix. And let's say it's got a little pocket in the shape of the protein that a small little molecule can fit into. So what's going to happen when this small molecule enters the allosteric regulatory site? Allosteric causes a change in shape. So it could be, for example, that that causes this protein no longer to look like a croissant, but to look like a hot dog bun. So the interaction of this small molecule in the active site causes a curved protein to straighten up and no longer bind the DNA. That's a, an example of what an allosteric interaction might do. So a binding event between some sort of small organic molecule usually, or inorganic, and a protein causes the protein to change shape. And in a new shape, that protein can't do whatever job it did in its original shape. Right, so now after this interaction, that protein no longer binds, no longer can bind the DNA. So arrows indicate positive interactions between proteins. Blunt arrows mean repression. Let's see, we just talked about this, and I really hate this diagram, so I'm actually going to skip past this. Allosteric regulation and how it works. A small molecule binds a protein and causes it to change shape. How many genes does it take for a bacterium to digest lactose? Three. They're called Z, Y, and A. I'm, it's horrible. Don't memorize it. Who cares? Lac Z, Lac Y, and Lac A. Three different genes. One, two, and three. They're all part of an operon. In bacteria, that means that they all get transcribed at the same time. They're all three genes that are necessary for a bacterium to process lactose. And so the bacterial genome has all these three genes organized into one, two, three, right next to each other on the chromosome. So when a bacterium needs to process lactose, it senses lactose in the medium, it does one transcription event, and it transcribes the genes, all three genes, at the same time, LACZ, LACY, and LACA. The other thing you need to know, so lac Z, lac Y, and lac A are proteins that are actually essential for processing lactose. The fourth gene here, lac I, encodes a protein that you can't see because it's underneath one of my, it's perfectly hidden right there. It says lac repressor, right underneath slide 13 of 28. So imagine that says lac repressor. So this is a protein that's, where's the lac repressor going to bind? What up here? Lac repressor is a DNA binding protein. Where is it going to bind? P, O, Z, Y, or A? O? 
Oh. Yeah. What does O stand for? Where do repressors bind? Operators. Exactly. So O is the operator, P is the promoter, and LAC, the gene product, the protein product of LAC I, LAC I is the name of the gene, it produces the protein that we call LAC repressor. Go figure. Which, for simplicity, I'm just going to call LAC R. It's easier to remember than LAC I. So LAC repressor binds the operator. Questions or concerns yet? Time for another prediction. If you're a bacterium and you find yourself being grown in my laboratory in the presence of lactose, do you want lac repressor to be present or absent? If you have bacterium, it's got lactose in the media. If you're the bacterium, what's your goal? regarding transcription up here. You want to be transcribing or not transcribing the LAC genes? You want to be transcribing the LAC genes because they're going to let you do three things to lactose, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay. So we don't want the repressor to be produced in the case where there's lactose present. On the other hand, when lactose is absent, no lactose present, now's when we want lac repressor turned on. We want this protein to be sitting on the operator sequence, preventing this enzyme. I have no idea why it's chewing on the DNA, because RNA polymerase doesn't actually do that. We want to prevent RNA polymerase from transcribing the lac Z, Y, and A genes when there's no lactose. You don't need the proteins if there's no sugar. So in the absence of lactose, you have no lac repressor. Or, sorry, no lactose present, you need lac repressor. It's going to sit there on the operator and prevent transcription of lac Z, lac Y, and lac A. So enter the best cartoon ever. Lac repressor. Right? What do its legs represent? Based on the drawing below that. What are its legs? Which domain of the protein are its legs? We talked about what different types of, what different regions of proteins can do. In this case, what are the legs doing down here? What molecule are they interacting with? <coughs> Sitting on the DNA. So this is its DNA binding domain. So lac repressor has one site that recognizes a specific sequence at the operator. There's a specific nucleotide sequence, the operator sequence, that lac repressor will recognize and bind to. What are we going to see its arms bind to? We're going to see that in just a second. Time to practice. So, so far you've seen lac repressor and the lac Z, Y, and A genes. So we've got lac repressor, and we've got that suite of three genes. What's the relationship between Repressor and ZYNA. What sort of an arrow do you draw here? What does lac repressor do to lac ZYA? Does it enhance, promote transcription, foster? Somebody give me a thesaurus. Or does it block, prevent, repress transcription? So lac repressor binds the operator and prevents transcription. So what, this is going to be an arrow head or a blunt arrow? The blunt. Okay. 
So LAC repressor represses LAC C, LAC Y, LAC A. Is there anything else we can add on to this figure yet? What is LAC repressor really repressing? There's an intermediate molecule in here. We could draw this a different way. So we could add in RNA polymerase. How does RNA polymerase, what does it do to LAC Z, Y, and A? So this is a parallel path. Does RNA polymerase promote, encourage, support transcription? Is it a pointed arrow, or does it prevent transcription? RNA polymerase. You better tell me it promotes transcription, because that's its job. So that would be an arrowhead. So RNA polymerase's normal job is to transcribe LAC C, LAC Y, and LAC A. So what physically did we say RNA polymerase is doing with regards to repressor? RNA polymerase gets recruited to the DNA. Then what does LAC repressor do to RNA polymerase? Is it an activating or is it a repressing? Yeah, it's repressing. Does this logic make sense? This is all about logic. If you've got a computer scientist in the room, you're probably pretty happy right now. Others of you might be kind of sad. Some of you look kind of sad. We've got two parallel pathways here. We've got LAC repressor and LAC ZYNA, the start and the, the end of the pathway. Here's just a longer version. Are those red and blue pathways equivalent? Do they mean the same thing? It's kind of like it, it is logic. In this pathway at the top, we've got a negative interaction. In this bottom pathway, we've got a negative interaction and a positive interaction. So a negative interaction, a positive interaction, don't cancel each other out. If you block the pathway, you block the pathway, regardless of how many of these arrowheads you've got. What does it mean if you've got this sort of an interaction? A represses B represses C. When you have A present, what happens, what's the effect on C? Is it present or is it absent? So what does B normally do to C? B normally represses C. So in the presence of B, C is absent. What does A normally do to B? A normally represses B. So in that case, in the presence of A, B is absent. In the absence of B, there's nothing to repress C. So it's a double negative. If you have two inhib inhibition steps, if you're turning off something that turns off something, <coughs> you've turned it on. So in this case, in the presence of A, It inhibits an inhibitor, B, so you get the presence of C, or the activity of protein C. So up in this example above, it doesn't matter whether there's one repression event or one repression event followed by an activating or supporting interaction. Each of these pathways only has one repressive event. It turns the pathway on. So about those arms of black repressor, right? Its legs bind DNA. What do its arms bind? <coughs> this is where the bacterium does its sensing. 
What is this protein bind to? It's arms. Say it louder. Lactose. I know no one said it at all. I figured if I said say it louder, somebody would say it. It binds to lactose, and this is its lactose binding domain. So this protein can bind to DNA, and it can bind to lactose. But it's bound to DNA, its arms are open, waiting to grab lactose. Once it grabs lactose, what happens to its DNA binding domain? It changes shape. So when lactopressor binds to a small molecule, the sugar, this is why this is the sensory step. This protein senses the presence or absence of the sugar and translates it into whether or not transcription can happen. So when the repressor is sitting there on the DNA, that's when there's no lactose. As soon as lactose is in the cell, it binds and lets go of the DNA. So a repressor no longer is sitting on the operator preventing RNA polymerase from transcribing. And as soon as all the lactose gets chewed up by the cell, what happens? Then there's nothing there to keep lactose repressor in that shape. And so it goes back to its original conservation, sitting on the DNA, waiting to bind another molecule of lactose. So that's exactly how the bacterium has a sense, a sense for whether or not it can taste, essentially, lactose. Lactose is present, it binds to the repressor, the repressor lets go of the DNA. Transcription ensues. So in that sense, lactose is an inducer. In the presence of lactose, you get transcription of lac Z, lac Y, and lac A. Okay. So if that's the case, what does our pathway look like now? So take a couple minutes, one and a half maybe, draw out the entire pathway. Should show lactose, the lac repressor. Let's add in RNA polymerase for fun. And lac ZYA genes. Feel free to discuss with the neighbor if you want. See if you can come up with the complete pathway, including all four of these players. very least, you should have all four of those players written down on the screen. You just have to figure out what are the interactions between them. Most of this we've already done before. We've just added in lactose now. So what did the original pathway look like? What's the, what's the effect of RNA polymerase on lac ZYA? Does it turn on transcription or turn off transcription? It's involved in transcription. RNA polymerase sustains, promotes, enhances transcription of these genes. Okay. So what else did we done before? So what's another interaction we've already talked about? Okay, so between lac repressor and RNA polymerase, does lac repressor do something good or something bad to polymerase? Okay, something bad. It blocks RNA polymerase from doing its normal job. So here's the new thing. What 
how would you draw the interaction of lactose in this pathway? Okay, so lactose, so lac repressor's normal job, its typical function is to repress. Lactose prevents lac repressor from doing its normal job. Right? Its normal job being to bind DNA and prevent transcription. In the presence of lactose, lac repressor can't do that, so lactose has an inhibitory effect on lac repressor. Okay. So for the first time, then, there's one of our double negatives. In the presence of lactose, lac repressor isn't repressing, therefore RNA polymerase is active or inactive? It's active. So in the presence of lactose plus lactose, you've got an active RNA polymerase transcribing the genes. If you don't have lactose, then lac repressors, they are doing its normal job inhibiting RNA polymerase. And in that situation, this pathway is inactive. And these things in organisms get really crazy. Yet four inhibitory effects, and then three active agent effects, and then there's a blunt arrowhead, an arrowhead, a blunt arrowhead, an arrowhead, when you look at these biochemical pathways. So this is just a tiny snapshot of what's going on inside a living organism at any one point in time. So here's a summary of what we've talked about so far. In a wild-type cell, this is all we've talked about so far is what happens normally to a normal bacteria. Right? Without lactose, you've got the repressor bound to the DNA, no transcription. You've got lactose, then you've got lac repressor bound to lactose, it's fallen off of the DNA, you've got transcription of Z, Y, and A. Now we're going to talk about, for the last three minutes or so today, and then there's another Socrative exercise, and we'll pick up next class, is what happens when you have mutations in this process? So again, that was just wild type. That's what normal bacteria do. But there are mutations in all of the players we've just talked about, in all of the proteins. You can have mutations that cause different effects on transcription, like this case. We've got two mutations. I'll tell you briefly about one, and then we'll pick up next time. We've got the OC mutation. I'm not talking about down near LA. It's the operator mutation. It's a C-type operator mutation. We've got LAC I minus. Remember, LAC I was LAC repressor. We, got, we can have mutations to the DNA sequence, the operator itself, where LAC repressor binds. And we can also have mutations to LAC repressor, the protein. Both of these types of mutations are what we call constitutive, and that's exactly what this picture represents. This is a constitutive mutation to a car. What does constitutive mean? We have anything that's constitutive. It means they're always on, as it says up here. So we had this car where the floor mat design was kind of shoddy, and every once in a while somebody would get the accelerator stuck underneath the floor mat. That's a constitutive mutation to your car. Right? You can't slow it down. It's always on. Pedal to the metal. That's what constitutive mutations do. So in this case, we're talking about mutations. We'll see these next time. Mutations that cause transcription to always occur, regardless of whether or not lactose is present. Constitutive mutations. All right. So in the last five minutes, please take the new Socratic quiz. It's exactly the same as the first one. I just want to see if the results change, and I'll tell you at the start of next class. So restart Socrative. For those of you that haven't yet memorized it, 240820, and after you're done, see you next class.